remind you that Thursday we'll have the discussions on the hydrogen sulfide uh, paper. One more little clue that might help you to, to figure out what I'm after. I'd like you to think of questions and that you would ask questions, either rhetorical questions or questions you really want to know the answer to. And really, ideally, the discussion could start this way. One person could ask a question, me or somebody else, and that could be the whole discussion. There wouldn't have to be any real um, uh, leading of, uh, or bringing up new subjects that it would happen spontaneously. Now, that's not going to happen for an hour, but maybe it will for a while. That's the kind of thing that would be ideal. The yeast and bacterial counting experiment is due on Thursday. Then from a week, week from Thursday, I should remind you that the fermentation rate experiment results are due. You should do the, get the data from your own group and also from one other uh, yeast. And your literature report will be due. That is uh, some sort of more or less short critique of a, an article that you have read. Now, that's a week from Thursday. On the results? Yes. Yes. No. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want to, you, you could uh, turn them in as a group even, because it's going to be the same results. But I think it's better if you do it yourself, even if you copy from somebody else, you at least have gotten that much gained on what, uh, what the actual uh, information was. Yeah? Well, when you wanted, uh, our results and the on the fermentation rate. In other words, you should do, you should do a control, which is a uh, Montreche and another, your own. Or if your own is Montreche, then you should do another one. Yes. Some of those you can't get the lactone. Well, I, I think you can. I mean, you, you, the data started about the, the worst one, about 13 bricks, right? Yeah. So you. 11. Is it 11? No. Well, that is bad. We got to, I don't think we need to do it over again. Do the best you can on that. You can get the lag period, though. Well, you have to fake it, but the lag period, <laughs> the lag period, say you have points over here, the lag period is this, this intersection here. That's the only way you can measure lag period. If you have, if you have something like this, there's no place you can actually put that point, so you do it this way. Yeah, I know, but you don't necessarily know that where you're reading is yeah. the falling of the curve, but also when it's starting. In other words, what you're saying is that maybe what you're seeing here is something quite a bit later. Well, let me let me fake it again. Let's see. No. That there's a there's a steeper part here, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, you just have to <coughs> assume that there isn't. The it's too bad that uh, the inoculations were made a little bit early. They should have been made late on Friday afternoon. Okay. Um, there will be a lab today, and a little short lab lecture before each one. I'd just be curious. Uh, We've got that little bottle in A that we took out of sample A on to measure malic acid content. I mean, can we do that like this afternoon? Because I'd be interested to know whether there was any malic acid in the original. Oh yeah, we have to we have to set up that, and we will we'll talk about it in the lab. But we'll start our chromatography um, regime again, so the person that's supposed to do that will do that. Because like the original, you know, the original one where they all went, we still have that little bottle. Right. Uh -huh. um, it's very unlikely that the malic Gas it was gone already because the pH it was reasonable on that grape juice. Okay. Well, let's we can take a minute or two and talk about bacterial identification. If you have any burning questions, uh, we can go into it more in lab too. I think that we covered pretty well the difference between aerobic and anaerobic organisms, and what microaerophilic meant, and how you could uh, have any sort of range in the lactic acid bacteria from oxida oxidative uh, users to non-oxygen users. One thing I didn't mention, it's always good to bring in something a little extra from last time, is that with the homofermentative, remember, we have an important enzyme. Where we have the glucose going down to the three carbon aldehyde. There's an enzyme here that breaks that. Do you know what that's called? Aldolase. And you can see that the heterofermentatives wouldn't need that because they're going here by a different pathway. And you might think, well, they may not need it, but they probably have it anyway so that some of, them can go th some of it can go this way. But in fact, 
the heterofemenatives do not have aldolase or aldolase negative, and that would be a new kind of way of uh, classifying the organisms. It's not used in the new burgies, but it could be. Homofermentatives are aldolase positive, the heterofermentatives are aldolase negative. Are there any questions uh, on bacteria ID before we go on to something else? Good. Well, if you like the bacterial identification and like the yeast identification, you're, you're going to even love more of what we're going to talk about now. <laughs> Brought to you by the same people. <laughs> Uh, the malolactic fermentation, the biochemistry of the malolactic fermentation, something dear to my heart and uh, uh, glad we're getting to it. The, you might talk about the mechanism of the fermentation inside the cell. Now this has been studied uh, since it was first discovered, which would have been sometime after Pasteur, that the early, around the turn of the century, early wine microbiologists were aware that bacteria were carrying out some sort of secondary metabolism. And I'm going to give you a reading assignment, two of them. It's in uh, reprint number one. That's uh, my review article. And you have two pages to read, 236, 237. And later on, there'll be another page, 369, uh, 269. This is of uh, the history of malolactic fermentation, uh, the studies of malolactic fermentation, up to the relative uh, recent uh, times when Ochoa, who was a biochemist, first started working on this and gave us an insight to what was going on. Now, Ochoa was also a Nobel Prize winner, was actually studying pigeon liver and pigeon breast uh, tissue, studying malic enzyme. Anybody know what malic enzyme is? Start with malic, I guess. Although that's such a, a screwy uh, terminology, nomenclature, that it shouldn't be used, and I don't think we should use it, but it is used. Malic's, the quotes around malic. No, it's not malic dehydrogenase. Hmm? Pyruvate, right. It's decarboxylation to pyruvate. Malic, what does malic dehydrogenase do? Right. Oxaloacetate. dehydrogenase, not a carboxylase. Well, in doing these studies, by the way, in, 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 in the liver, um, pardon me, in pigeons, this is an NADP enzyme required here. And you get a reduction, you get NADPH. He was looking for a way to measure malic acid, an easy way to measure malic acid. And so he went to, as a lot of people have done in the past, to bacteria and looked at a lactobacillus which used malic acid. And he got interested in it and looked at the enzymes there. And he found something partly like that. But in this case, he found malate apparently going directly to lactate. That's carbon dioxide. And requiring manganus ion or some other covalent ions and NAD as a cofactor. And he reasoned, well, if NAD is required, there must be a redox reaction here. And what obviously is happening, according to his way of thinking, is that you're having this part of the reaction, only using NAD, coupled with, if you reoxidize NAD, H, what would you get? NAD, but I mean, what would you get here? Lactate. So he said that's what this reaction was, was a coupling of those two enzymes together to give this. In fact, he never was able to prove it, and he tried very much to try to find pyruvate and only found less than 1% ever of pyruvate. And you know, there's a trick he could use here to see if he could, if he could trap pyruvate. You know what it is? Have any of you done that, um, the, malic the malic acid analysis with the, uh, with the malic dehydrogenase? I think you have. What do you put in there to make the reaction go one direction, to trap, in that case, oxaloacetic? You put a hydrazine, something to trap a keto compound. So he put hydrazine in here to try to trap the pyruvate, but he didn't get it. He couldn't trap it. Yeah. It's never released from the enzyme. If he's assuming it's one enzyme, it's never released from the enzyme. Well, he, was, he wasn't necessarily assuming it was one enzyme. He thought it was coupled to, but then he finally came to that conclusion that, what, that it must be 
either one enzyme doing both of these reactions or two enzymes so tightly bound that, that you couldn't get the pyruvate off. As a matter of fact, as he pur tried to purify this, he did find that he had both L and D lactic dehydrogenase here, and he was able to get rid of the D lactic dehydrogenase, but the L stayed. Uh, pardon me, <laughs> he didn't find the L, but he was able to get rid of the D dehydrogenase, but this, this other complex, or whatever it is, kept purifying together. So he assumed that there were two enzymes either very closely associated or that it was one enzyme doing this. Well, let's assume that that's what's happening, that we're getting something like this overall. Um, then there comes a, a question I think a lot of people are asking, well, why does a cell carry out this sort of reaction? What is happening? What good is it for the cell? From a teleological point of view or from just modern uh, biochemistry, what good is it? One first thing you think about, is malic acid being, being used as an energy source? Well, what do, we have to, what do we have to find out if we're using malic acid as an energy source? We have to, hmm? What? Yeah, we have to, fee we have to find out, that you answered the right questions, uh, but there's another question before that. Uh, you see if there's any ATP formed, or maybe any, any, any NADH formed, or you see if malic acid can be used as an energy source. But the first thing you might want to do is see thermodynamically what this reaction shows, what kind of free energy this will allow you to have, if there is any. If there's none, if it, if it has to go this direction, then, this, then you know that energy is not being uh, obtained by this reaction. Well, we did some calculations, and we did find that we got overall reaction, a delta F of about minus eight kilocalories, or delta G, I should say. Um, which would be enough for, perhaps enough for almost for one ATP uh, formation. This was under standard temp... This is the overall reaction. Let me put it down. This is under standard temperature and pressure conditions. And we tried to thought, well, wine conditions are quite a bit different. Because, for example, this at, at this at pH 7, where these are done, you have this sort of reaction, this sort of uh, isomerization. Pardon. Uh, you have these both ionized. And what's happening? At, stand, at pH 7, what's happening when you're going from here to here? The equation doesn't balance that way. You have to pick up a proton. So you're getting this CO2 off and you'd have CH2 here. So you have to pick up a proton. So it would indicate then, if you had a lower pH in, at what conditions of wine, this, the protons present would force the reaction this way and you perhaps get a better favorable equilibrium. The trouble is though, at wine pHs, these are both in the unionized form, and this proton doesn't become very important. So actually, this is at standard temperature and pressure. And at wine, considering the, the, some CO2 present, and at other temperature, at, at cellar temperature, and uh, at pH, say, 3.4, we ended up with just a little bit better delta free energy. Straining at gnats, perhaps. But we want this, this figure came up if the CO2 was released in the anhydrous form. And in any case where this has been studied, not this enzyme, but where people have done decarboxylations, CO2 has been given off in the anhydrous form. We did some calculations. If it were given off in, the, in a hydrated form, so as, say as bicarbonate or carbonate or um, carbonic acid itself, we wouldn't have as much uh, free energy here. Do you know of any way you could tell whether that's hydrated or not? You know any experiments that have been done to show that? Hmm? Yeah, uh, Paul? Well, these are, just these enzymes are known. No, but I mean, if it's Well, if you, you have to get on the molecular, at the molecular level, yeah, but how do you do it? I guess that's the question. 
Well, maybe there are ways you can do that, but there is another, there's another enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, which, which, uh, was that what you said? <laughs> Excuse me. Which uh, catalyzes the, hydro the hydration of CO2, and you could add carbon di uh, carbonic anhydrase and see if that affects the rate of CO2 given off or not. And we did this and found out that it, indeed it was not, it wasn't anhydrous as it is with other cases of, uh, of decarboxylations, it was hydrated, but you can't tell which form it's hydrated in, uh, whether it's a carbonic, uh, bicarbonate, or, uh, or carbonic acid. But so we got a range of activities then that it possibly could be, or I should say, uh, free energies from minus seven to minus two point six. So the point of this part <laughs> I'm getting at is that in any case you're getting less than one ATP. So it seemed that this reaction couldn't be very important for the cell's uh, energy economy. And furthermore, somebody pointed out there isn't any ATP formed, as we could see from this, and there's no net change in, in redox state of NAD. So it seemed that the cell couldn't use malic acid for, as an energy source. And so the, the question is, well, does it or not? As somebody suggested, we should try this. And the, the history of this, this has been tried lots of times. People have, with mixed results, but most people have said that you can't get malic acid decarboxylated in growing cell cultures unless there is an, another energy source. It can be done in resting cell cultures that have been induced for the enzyme, and you have lots of cells there, and you add malic acid, you can get some decarboxylation. <clears throat> so, um, okay, a little ahead of the story, we, we, we wondered then, um, this is one question then, what good is it to the cell, whether it's getting energy or not, what, if it's not getting energy, what good is it uh, to the cell, and we had to find out if it was, was given energy or not, and there is a way that even in spite of uh, this no ATP or any reduced NAD being formed, that you could envision that the cell could benefit from it energetically. And that is, as somebody perhaps has suggested, that if this pyruvate isn't 100% bound tightly, if a small amount could come off, now remember uh, uh, Ochoa found less than 1% pyruvate, a very small amount, but say you found less than 1% of it coming off, now the pyruvate formed, remember what it can, what it can do, we, had, we talked about hetero and homolactic fermentation. What can pyruvate do? Yeah, well, it can, it can go to acetyl-CoA, perhaps, and form an ATP. And it also can um, be a hydrogen acceptor as itself to go to lactate or going to acetyl-phosphate and being a hydrogen acceptor, acceptor in two places. So there is a possibility that, if, that, evolutionarily speaking, if a tiny bit of pyruvate came off the enzyme that this, these organisms that were malolactic, that had this scheme, might be a little bit, uh, have a little bit of advantage over those organisms that did not. So this is one of the questions we felt we needed to find out, was what was the purpose of the, if any, of the malolactic reaction for the organism? And the second is, what is the pathway? Is pyruvate really involved or not? So if these two questions of mine will go on. So the first thing we wanted to find out is, is, is to see if malic could be used as an energy source. Now, people have tried to measure, measure this <clears throat> lots of times, and, uh, but I don't think there have been any rigorous uh, attempts where they were looking at very, very small amounts of malic to be, to be formed. Now, one thing that does happen during the malolactic fermentation, we're getting a change in pH, and this sometimes can be considered as a helpful thing that the cells are, are changing the pH of the medium and therefore are growing better, not only themselves, but all the cells that are in this milieu. So we had to be sure that, that whatever we were looking at wasn't, a, wasn't just due to, the, to a change of pH. So the first experiments we did were to, to uh, actually measure amount of growth in the presence of um, rather large amounts of malic acid itself. Um, and we found a tiny, tiny bit of, of increase in, in growth. Not very much, not enough to get very excited about, not enough to make to think that it's important biochemically for the cell at the moment, but enough that one might think, well, it might have a little bit of advantage over some of its uh, neighbors, or, or, uh, evolutionarily speaking. 
That's with malic alone. The problem is we were using ML34, which is very fastidious and requires, for good growth, requires tomato juice. And tomato juice has sugar in it. And so this was a problem, either not leaving out the tomato juice and getting very poor growth, or using what we call spent medium, medium in which the carbohydrates have been utilized by cells, and then filtering this, and then um, uh, sterilizing it by filtration, and re-inoculating again. <coughs> well, what about the stage thing? Okay, I'm coming to that now. Okay, I mean, I got ahead of myself on that. The first thing is we looked at malic by itself. The next thing was, well, maybe what happens in malic in the presence of a carbohydrate source? Maybe the two together act synergistically, and malic will have, give the carbohydrate an advantage. And that's where I should have brought about, up about the pH. That people have reported this, that you get, you get stimulation of growth in the presence of malic acid, but they have never controlled the pH. And let's say that you're growing organisms at um, pH of 5 with glucose. And you get a certain amount of growth yield. And then you put in malic acid there also at pH 5. Well, the conversion of malic to lactic is going to take it up maybe to 5.5, let's say. Now these cells will grow better. And so there has been reports that malic acid did stimulate the amount of growth or stimulated the utilization of other carbohydrates, but this seemed to always be a pH effect. So we wanted to check this again uh, on two different ways. One, looking at molar growth yields where we had low levels, just uh, not extra levels of glucose where this couldn't happen, where you have a minimum amount of glucose present and see if the malic acid had any effect on it. And also to do it under controlled pH conditions, for example, at optimum pH, so that any pH shift would be detrimental to the growth of the organism. Well, I have some slides, and uh, John, I wonder if you could, um, oh, they're here. Find out what's the reason for uh, malolactic fermentation, if there was any benefit gained to the cell by it. Um, I think I turned it on, John. Yeah, you have to put it at zero first. Maybe this, uh, Rick, you know how to handle it? Why don't you go back to it? Each one's different. <laughs> so the first thing we wanted to answer the question is what good is the malolactic fermentation? Then we wanted to look to see if it had anything to do with energy or not. And using malic acid by itself, we got essentially no growth. So now we wanted to try it in the presence of glucose, and we wanted to make sure it wasn't a pH effect. And so we did this by by using limited amount of glucose so that if, if the malic acid were stimulating the pH, it still couldn't stimulate the growth. If the, if the growth were being stimulated because of change in pH, if there was no more glucose, it wouldn't happen. No, you can push it on the side there. Maybe I better do it. Can, uh, well, let me go back. Case where we had, then this is the, the amount of glucose added. These are minimal amounts of glucose added, and this is without malic acid. And at zero, we got some growth because this medium did, did, did have some other nutrients in it. But we increased the amount of glucose. We got the increased amount of growth here. This is the final amount of growth one got. This is, um, this is fumarate. Leave this, forget this one. This is with malic then. We added malic acid, to the same amount, to each one of these amounts of glucose, and we got increased growth at the same slope, or practically the same slope. That slope is a little bit higher, but not stati statistically significant. But practically the same slope, indicating then that the malic acid is not uh, increasing the efficiency of the glucose as far as growth yield is concerned, as amount, amount of cells being formed. Now, there, okay, the, the malic acid is not doing anything as far as the utilization of glucose goes, as in rela in, uh, respect, with respect to the cell yield, the total amount of cells being formed. Could you explain this to be oh, this, one, this is fumarate. <coughs> Leave this one out. But this one is without malic, this is with malic. Now we do see that it's higher, which means that back here someplace we extrapolate where there is some endogenous uh, glucose or other nutrients present, that there must be a change in slope down here someplace. And probably very dramatic at the very beginning but at, at cell levels that you can actually really measure, there is no, there is no change. The, the, the point of that is that then to look at growth yield, the amount of cells being formed, the malic acid has no effect. Yeah. Is 
from okay, is this, is this for a constant amount of uh, malic acid? Yes, in all cases, constant amount of malic acid. If malic acid were stimulating the utilization of glucose or the efficiency of the utilization of glucose, we would have gotten an increased slope here. But, you yeah. know. You're saying the yields don't increase with the rate does. No, the yields don't increase. The rate, we haven't come to the rate yet. We're talking about in the end formation. Um, and that's not, that's the point, is that the total cell yield is not the only thing one has to look at. Yeah. I don't understand if this is one experiment or two. Like, are you controlling the pH on the This isn't with time. This is the final, these are, each one of these dots is a fermentation. With different, each one has different amounts of glucose. This one is without malic. These are without malic and these are with malic. And at the end of the experiment, one measures the turbidity or the dry weight. Yeah. Yeah, if we had one. <laughs> that's one that's one way you could do it. But that and we get the same answer, I presume, on this. Um, yeah. The the other way is to do what we did, do it at the optimal pH. And we'll come to that. The, the the next thing we wanted to look at though was were these reports that people said that you would get different end products formed depending upon malate being present or not, besides the lactic acid from malic acid itself. And so at the, the same kind of experiment, we looked, at, we looked at some end products. And if you can just touch that real lightly, John. Just real lightly. No, same thing. No, just. Oh, what a heavy hand. There. Yeah. OK. And here, we, this is a very interesting experiment which spurred us on. We were almost ready to give up by, by then. We were doing experiments with spent medium, in which we got rid of all of the endogenous carbohydrates to see if we could get any effect of malic acid there. And there was a very, very tiny, tiny one, very hard to measure and very hard to put much uh, faith in. But here now, if we took glucose and we just looked at the amount of lactic acid being formed. Now, theoretically, this is uh, leuconostoc. We should only get D-lactic acid. Now, remember I explained that this was, uh, you base leuconostoc on the, on the basis that it does only form D-lactic acid. So you're making an assumption there that the cell only makes D-lactic acid. But that's what theoretically would say, make this much, no lactic acid, L-lactic acid from glucose, and this much D-lactic acid from the certain amount of glucose we had. Actually, we got a little bit of L-lactic acid, which isn't surprising, and about what you would expect from the glucose itself and D-lactic acid. Now we wanted to see what happened to it if we added malic acid itself. Now, if we add malic acid alone, nothing happens. We get so little growth, we can't do any measurement. So how can we tell if malic acid has an effect? What would you do? You put it with glucose and subtract the effect of glucose itself. And that difference then would be the effect due to malic acid. So that's what we did. Taking malic acid, we would have expected only L-lactic acid, we'll talk about this later, that it turns out that the reaction seems to be 100% uh, L-malic to L-lactic with none for, to D-lactic from malic acid itself. And what did we actually get? Very close. The amount of L-lactic acid was almost stoichiometric with the amount of L-malic we had. But look here what we got. We got this where we shouldn't, got, shouldn't have gotten any D-lactic. We got twice as much uh, as we did from glucose alone over that amount of glucose. Now, with this amount had already been subtracted from the total D-lactic acid we had. This is an astounding figure that we were getting tremendous amounts of, lact of D lactic acid being formed from somewhere. It's not coming out of, uh, it's not m mystical or magic. Um, it, it's not coming from um, glucose. It's coming from some other sources in this very enriched medium. And this is not a pH effect because this was done at optimal pH. Any change, any change in pH on either would have um, made less growth on either side of that, of that optimal pH. So we knew then that there's something that was pretty exciting happening to the cell. We couldn't say that the cell was not being affected by the malolactic fermentation, that something was going on. And so what else could it be? As somebody suggested in the front, well, why not look at the growth rate? Not the amount that's made at the end, but how quickly it's made to get there. Okay, so far? So that's the thing we did. Next. Got it. <laughs> okay, here's the control. Now, this is the growth rate. Now, you know how to do this, and you will know how to do it uh, in our next experiments we're going to do. We do a specific growth rate constant by taking the, the slope of the log increase of the cells with time. And we can do this at several pHs to get 
an optimal pH around here. On either side of this pH, you get less growth rate. The growth rate is less. This is without malic acid. So we tried it with malic acid, and we really got an astounding results here, I think, that you increase the growth rate way up to here, and this can't be a pH effect. If it, because any time you're changing the pH here, you're lowering the growth, specific growth rate. In all these cases, you're getting an increase in, in specific growth, growth rate. In other words, malic acid is stimulating the growth. And this is at optimal pH. We thought, well, let's try it at, at uh, p wine pH. And I should say now that almost none of the work that's been done on malolactic fermentation has been done at wine pH, mainly because it's very difficult to get the cells to grow at that pH. You can put them in a medium at pH 3.5, and the, and the bacteria just more or less sit there. Yeah. Now what you're saying is if you're adding malic acid to that at the optimal pH, you've got higher production of uh, uh, increased growth rate. The cell yield, the cell yield was not affected. What kind of, you're adding L-malic acid? L-malic acid, yeah. And, and it turns out that at any of the pHs we added, we got an, we got an increase. Okay, so we thought we'd try it at low, at low pH. So the next one, John. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's really high there. We haven't, we haven't pursued this at this pH, no. So we did it at low pH. Now, the, at, at pH of wine, it's so difficult to get a growth rate. The cells just go very, very slowly. That shouldn't be enough reason, but they're they not very amenable to getting a good uh, curve. So instead of getting the growth rate, we, we pl plotted the actual data here. And here's the control. And look at this. This is over 10 days, period. See, so you, this is nice kinds of experiments. You could come in once a day. Yeah, or once every two days and take your readings. Uh, this is Mr. Poloni's. I think he worked a little harder than that. Um, so this is the uh, increase in optical density on a log scale. This is the control. And we get that kind of growth. Then we add malic acid, and we got a big increase here. But then you say, aha, but you're not controlling the pH in this case. So we wanted to see if we could do that. We know that in the, in the control, the pH doesn't change much. This is the starting pH. This is the end pH. In the malolactic one, we got a little bit more, a 0.1 per, uh, uh, unit increase, 365 to 3.77. So to control this, we started at, at a higher pH than that ended with to see what effect that had. And it did stimulate the growth, but not near as much as the, this is without malic acid, not near as much as with the malic acid. And you do notice that the, that the, the yield comes out the same. So the yield, any increase in yield that people have been getting is due to a pH effect. But the, the growth rate change is due to the malic acid. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah. It's due in part to the malic acid. It's due also to the pH change. Yes, do both. But the malic acid itself is doing something. So this, um, that, you can turn the, 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 the um, projector off. I have some slides of spores, which I'll show in a minute. Wait a minute. They want to see. No, this is the pH. Yeah, this is the pH at the beginning of the control. This is the pH at the end of the control. There's not much change. Okay, you can turn the light off now. And maybe the really lights. Oh, I get one. Maybe. Okay. So we seem to answer one of our questions then, that yes, the malolactic fermentation is doing something very uh, special to the cell. It's stimulating the, the growth rate of the cell. As yet, we don't have, at this, at this point in time, as people say, we didn't have uh, the answer, our end answer, as to how this, how this stimulation is occurring. It's but, not a real tremendous or a real large Oh, I think it's quite, quite striking, yes, because you're getting almost the difference between growth and no growth in that last slide at those low pH. In 10 days, you saw there was, that was a log scale. It was very hardly able to tell the difference, but you get good turbidity in the presence of malic acid. We've done this with some other organisms, I might say, and it's really, in some cases, it's really so striking, the difference uh, between one day and, and months about the, the um, amount of growth that one gets. Is this true for yeast, No. No, not, not yeast at all. And it's not, not necessarily true with all lactic acid bacteria. We just tried it with a few. Not necessarily even true with all malolactic bacteria. Um, that, well, this was all with ML34. By the way, yeast do something entirely different. Yeast 
uh, there is some data on what yeast do, and they, some yeast will uh, ferment it to CO2 and water and some to, to ethanol, but it's not to lactic acid as this is. So then we wanted to see, well, um, how, how, could this, how could this be? How did we uh, get, uh, if we have this kind of a, this kind of a, a scheme where there's no NAD and very little uh, uh, delta uh, free energy formed, no ATP, how is it that we're able to get the, um, the, the input to get the stimulation of growth? Well, uh, the question is then what is the pathway then? Is this really just this, uh, more or less uh, decarboxylation of malic to lactate? I should say that in the meantime, people, other enzymes have been found that require NAD as a coenzyme, but were not redox uh, uh, enzymes. So it's quite likely that the NAD was being used just as a, um, a coenzyme here and not involved in any, any, any fancy thing here, which brought about this whole discussion that Ochoa assumed because the NAD was here that we had to have the two reactions. Well, I think most of you know uh, Dr. Schutz, Ricky Schutz. He did some work in Mainz trying to or purifying this enzyme to see if he could see if it was really true if any pyruvate did come off or if there were two enzymes instead of one or not in order to kind of answer this question where is the stimulation coming from it's a very difficult enzyme to purify but he got a several fold purification and they weren't able to find any pyruvate they weren't able to stimulate the reaction using hydrazine they weren't able to break open the to break the complex if it were two enzymes. Do you know how you might do this? If you thought there were two enzymes, how you might take them apart? One way would be using urea or some other slightly denaturing enzymes, uh, um, agents. None of these things brought about two enzyme activities. They couldn't get pyruvate to enter into the reaction uh, anyway, to get pyruvate to go to either way. And so their conclusions were then that this is a direct decarboxylation. So this was even more baffling to add this fuel to, the, to Ochoa's fire that, that pyruvate is not involved in this reaction. So uh, another student here, Richard Moranzoni, some of you may know, um, thought, well, let's just look at this and see if on the enzyme, if NAD is held there and is reduced. If it is actually reduced and is serving in a redox fashion, that means that either pyruvate or oxaloacetic acid must be formed in a very fleeting amount for a short period of time, and if it is, then perhaps some of it spills off. And you may not need very much to get the stimulatory effect. And so he tried this, and he looked in the spectrophotometer, and he couldn't find any any uh, Im, any influence of uh, any any a trace of uh, reduced NAD. The way you would do this, you'd set up your reaction with, um, let's say, NAD and manganocyan and enzyme and with a the recorder then have this on the, um, the, the OD at 340 where you would measure reduced NAD and then and then add malate as a substrate and you would hopefully you have your recorder you would have the optical density being constant then you get a blip up until that amount of malate was used and then it would drop off again you would hope to see some kind of a little blip like that never able to find any reduced NAD. But there is another way, a more sensitive way of measuring NAD, NADH, I should say. And that is by using a fluorometer. And we, fortunately, we had one in the department. And so we went to use a fluorometer, which is about 100 times more sensitive than the spectrophotometer, set up the experiment the same way, hoped for this. But instead of getting this, lo and behold, we got this. That with, a, with this very sensitive instrument, hmm, a straight line, I mean, um, we were getting a continual formation of NADH. Very small indeed, but um, a measurable amount. And it turned out to be about 0.2% of the, of the uh, utilization of malic going to, say, the uh, to lactic acid. Now, this isn't just an intestinal Yes. This is self-free extract. I mean, it's, this, the cells have been broken open. So this means then that either pyruvate or oxaloacetic acid is formed. You can see that it could be either one. One thing I didn't mention that the possibility would be that malate could go to pyruvate by this scheme. By, you could go 
by way of a malic dehydrogenase to oxaloacetic acid and then to pyruvate decarboxylated by a malic type enzyme. Is that clear? Huh? Yeah, uh, but this was, this was a, a possibility, and it turned out we ruled it out because the pHs were wrong. We couldn't measure any MDH in the cell free extract at the pHs that they should have been. But it was a possibility, and if NADH was being formed here, then we had to think that either this end product or this end product was being formed. I should say, yes, and then this, if this reaction is true, then hydrazine, hydrazine should stimulate it, shouldn't it? Because we're going to be pulling the alpha keto acid away, and it stimulated it tremendously. Now, you wouldn't see this on this other reaction with hydrazine because it's a very small, um, uh, proportionally very, very tiny, but it stimulated the small amount a lot. Furthermore, pyruvate inhibited it, inhibited the reaction. So it seemed that, that an alpha keto acid was being formed, and it seemed that it was pyruvate because it was inhibiting it. How could you tell which of these two were formed? What would you do? if you wanted to do the experiment. You think of an easy way to, to distinguish pyruvate from oxaloacetic acid? Well, you can use enzymes. You could use malic dehydrogenase, right? We take this to, to malate, and you could use lactic dehydrogenase for this. And he did, and found out that it was pyruvate. So although this is a very small amount in cell-free extract, it's possible that in the cell, it's a tremendous amount. And they're in vivo, in vitro conditions, pardon me, in vivo conditions, where you don't have pyruvate, where you have the pyruvate being shunted away so that you aren't inhibiting the reaction, you could get this to be a substantial amount of the reaction. Now, two other things have happened that, that substantiate this. One, Candler. Did some work with, with um, radioactive, uh, or I should say, um, deuter uh, de deuter deuterated, deuterated malic acid in the in the number two position, and looked at the, looked then at the the lactose formed, and in D lactose, which comes from glucose, he found some of the deuterium which meant that it had to come by way of NAD. NADD, okay. That this must have gone by way of NAD to, to form, pardon me, let's see, I got that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. A di direct decarboxylation, ah, pardon me. He found a, a change in the, in the concentration of deuterium, which meant if it were a direct decarboxylation, you would get, here we get, you would get L-lactose with the deuterium in it. But pardon, no, that's right. You got D-lactose with some of the deuterium in it, which meant it had to come by way of reduced NAD. The other thing that's interesting is that how, as we mentioned before, what's this, how is this going to stimulate um, cell growth? We said that pyruvate could serve as a hydrogen acceptor. And there is some work indicating, showing that, that that's exactly what happens when you had hydrogen acceptors to some of these organisms, uh, including um, ML34. On the reading list, you'll see there one paper by Luti where they used uh, leuconostox and added uh, fructose, which is a um, hydrogen acceptor, and pyruvate and got uh, stimulation of growth. Not growth, not total growth, but of growth rate. And also some work done in New York with ML34 where they where auto, they used autoclave tomato juice and found a big stimulatory effect. It turns out that when you autoclave tomato juice and other sugars, you get fructose, which wasn't there before, and the fructose is adding, acting as a hydrogen acceptor. And uh, that stimulated the growth. And you wonder, well, how can this be? Why does this stimulate the growth? And you know in your scheme where you have glucose going down to these end products, there are places where you have to wait for reoxidized coenzymes, a couple of places. And the cell has to build, slowly build up these um, substrates so that they can reoxidize the NADH so that the, the glucose can then be fermented. And that's apparently what's happening when you add these hydrogen acceptors, 
uh, which has been demonstrated that you get stimulation of growth. By adding hydrogen acceptors, that sparks the reaction so the cells don't have to wait around for the NAD, for substrates for the NADH to be reoxidized. Now, this doesn't have much effect on the total cell yield, but it has a great effect on the, on the growth rate itself. So this is one of the possibilities that, that um, what is happening here, that the pyruvate coming off here or the acetyl phosphate formed from that is acting like a hydrogen, acting as a hydrogen acceptor and thus sparking or stimulating the initial growth rate. There's a question? Okay. There's... Uh, Between the expense of keeping the NADH on, on your enzyme too. Here no. Uh, hydrogen acceptor, but your well, this enzyme, that's the only thing it's doing, presumably. The only thing this enzyme is for is to, is to generate, um, or for in this role, at least, is to generate hydrogen acceptor for the cell to use to get started. And, and you can see evolutionarily that'd be important. That no, no, no. Oh, you're using up a, using up a, no, but you get two with acetyl phosphate, you, you reoxidize two. That's right, you get one. But you, you have to balance the equation, that's right. But if you go to acetyl phosphate, then it can act as a hydrogen acceptor for two NADHs. And you're using one AD, NAD to get there. Good point. There is one other possibility, is that uh, what's happening, why malolactic fermentation stimulates growth. That has nothing to do with this, and that's the effect of carbon dioxide. It's known also to stimulate the growth of, say, ML34. And so just the carbon dioxide coming off the enzyme might do the stimulation. But you think, well, gee whiz, you're getting a lot of CO2. First of all, the wine is loaded with CO2. And you're getting a lot of CO2 from, uh, from glucose itself under heterolactic fermentation. But remember now that we're doing this in, if we're doing this in wine where there's no glucose, the glucose is all gone. All we have is pentoses. And we have pentoses, you're not getting the CO2 off in a heterolactic fermentation. And if this is later in the year, the CO2 levels might be quite low. So this is another possibility that has to be looked at. Just one second more. How would you, how would you come about, what would you do to try to prove this? How would you decide which of these, which of these mechanisms is uh, important? Yes, I think what you need to do, that's one of the things, you have to do that and you have to do the enzyme studies. You have to do a correlation between the, the effect of stimulation of growth by malic acid. Try a whole range of organisms and you can rate these in order of how much stimulatory effect you get by malic acid itself. Then you look at the stimulation of CO2, then you look at these enzymes and see with uh, this enzyme and this enzyme, how much, um, how important they are in the cell. I mean, how much, how active they are. And if you can get a good correlation, that would be good reason to suspect that that is the mechanism. It wouldn't be proof, it would be good reason to suspect. On the other hand, if you didn't get good correlation, then you would probably say that it is not that mechanism and we'd have to look elsewhere. Um, a few more things to talk about just in general about malolactic fermentation, but I'll take them up next time. I just wanted to get this part where we think that the, we think we've, saw, we've answered the two questions, is what is the role of, um, or is there a role of malolactic fermentation for the cell's economy and the pathway? Uh, we think we know the pathway too. Okay, we'll meet in about 10 minutes in the section one in the lab.